Good evening. So we're in class four of uh, lectures on Jiju Zammai, this text by uh, Menzan Osho um, regarding the true way. Let's just say that. Um, just to let you know, um, if my wife shows up at the door, I will leave. <laughs> and that's because our oldest daughter Anzu is in labor right now so it sounds like it won't be right now like it sounds like it'll be a little bit like in the middle of the night but um, anyway if she shows up there then I will leave and you will all be awakened <laughs> so um, uh, so I'm very excited um, and we'll see if I can stay um, the appropriate mind of dis- appropriate quantity of distracted um, so We've been into the text for a couple, a uh, few weeks now, and, and a couple things just to encourage people. It's not a very long text, and um, while it's, it can be a challenging text in some ways, it's also kind of explanatory type of a text. And so often what happens when you're reading explanatory text, you read it and you understand some parts and you don't understand other parts and you're kind of done. That's how explanations are. You sort of heard them, and then you kind of get it, or you don't, and then you kind of go, mm. So I want to encourage you not to do that. Go back and read it again. Don't worry about the things that don't make sense to you. Um, but as you, read them, as you read them again and again, different parts of it might appeal to you in different ways. And um, I, I like Menzan's teaching. It's not quite as sexy as Dogen. Like, De- Dogen is so, like... Uh, uh, enigmatic and poetic and you can read what he's saying in so many different ways and Manzan's a little bit more like look people gong 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 but he also has this other kind of this other kind of quality so for me sometimes it's harder with Manzan to read over and over because it has a little more of that little maybe lecture type feel but I encourage you to do that go and read the notes Right? And then also think about, um, I'm trying not to follow, just follow the text and say, let's look at this paragraph, let's look at this paragraph. And again, the reason for that is because um, the purpose of this kind of class is to build a relationship with a text. So that's kind of your homework, is to build a relationship with a text. My job is to give you some of my reflections on the text. And hopefully those two things come together um, and, and help, the, help it come alive. Um, I had said in the first class that I felt like... Um, uh, you know, Menzon is really making a big effort here to try to clarify what our practice of Zazen is. And here I say our because he's talking about the Soto school's approach. And really what we think of in the modern day as the Soto school approach to, um, uh, to meditation, or maybe that's even not the best word, um, Menzon was one of the very key figures who uh, developed that. Re, uh, kind of regathered Dogen's teachings after many hundreds of years of them being almost, you know, absent from, from people's study, and bringing them into the forefront and and doing an interpretive process to make them live in his time and place, and that's what set in motion what we think of as um, the Soto school today. So going back to someone like Menzan is really um, is really helpful. Um, you know, I was thinking the other day, you could call him like a neo-Doganist, maybe, you know, <laughs> like, like if Dogen met Menzon, he'd probably be like, what are you talking about? Right. But that's not the point. He's making Dogen's way live in the time that he's in. And, um, and we're doing the same thing. And so um, it can be helpful to see uh, how that's all happened. So I've been focusing a lot on this, um, uh, this uh, point that um, Menzon is making that if we use uh, practice, if we use our Zen as a kind of a lever, or if we use it as a kind of a technique for encountering awakening, that we're sowing the very seeds of delusion that we're trying to overcome. Mm-hmm. Okay? This basic, kind of very foundational um, thing. If we try to take awakening over delusion, then we're just doing a deluded thing. We're, we're, we're approaching enlightenment from delusion. And, um, and that kind of, um, uh, that kind of uh, um, uh, way of practicing is based in ignorance or based in illusory mind, which we'll go in a little bit um, uh, tonight. And so I've been using this, um, 
this way of talking about it a little bit, that when we try to cut off delusion and open enlightenment, again, we're like a deluded being, do the practice and become a Buddha, cut off the delusion and opening and open the enlightenment, that he's saying this is really problematic because we're breaking something fundamental. Um, and that he's more interested in talking about this process in which we see that the awakening is present in each person, in each moment, in everything. The wholeness of awakening is part of all things, even things that we might call deluded. And that our job isn't so much to cut off the delusion, it's to, um, it's to see in a different way in which we're not trying to resist the, the delusion. And I was, com I was uh, comparing that to these very famous, famous um, poems by the Sixth Ancestor and the monk who was thought would probably become the Sixth Ancestor. These oftentimes are two poems that are used um, to give a face to the gradual teaching or the sudden teaching. So that's a big split within Buddhist um, practice in general, and antiquity anyway. Um, is the process of awakening something gradual or is it something that happens all of a sudden? And that was a big debate, right? So is it like something you can work your way into, or is it something that's like, bang? That was, that was kind of the tenor of the debate, but it had a deeper meaning than that. On that level, my opinion is who cares? It's not important, like that's not, that's not a, like, it's just a kind of like scheme for how I'm gonna become awakened when you're thinking on that level. But there's a deeper thing in it, which is, is awakening something fundamental that we're waking up to or is it something that is created in some way? And that debate was more, I think, was more important. So oftentimes what's called the gradual, prop, the gradual school would be one in which you would build up your awakening and then come to a full awakening. This was, um, this kind of thinking um, uh, has its place but it tends to fall into this type of a thing. Like I'm gonna go through a process of purification to become a Buddha. I'm gonna take off all the extra stuff or I'm gonna get rid of all the problems. And what became the dominant philosophy within the Zen schools, as um, this poem uh, signified from the sudden enlightenment is, no, there's no edge to the mirror. Right? The bright mirror has no stand. Okay, that's a really interesting line. There's this bright mirror, but you can't define it in uh, a stand, a stand, or a, what's that thing called? A shifero? 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 Is that the thing you put your clothes in? Shifero. A shifero? A shifero? Shifero. A shifero? I think so. Yeah, and it's got a mirror in it a lot of times, right? Yes. Yeah. No shifero. <laughs> Only mirror. Or you could say the shifero is mirror. All is mirror. You can't contain it. That's the idea here. The bright mirror has no stand. The bright mirror has no edge. It has no place where it stops. And as such, there isn't a single thing. Where could dust fall? Okay. So he's taking, he's taking an image here, which is really different than our mind right, is a mirror. Like our body is the, is the stand for the mirror. And that mirror there, we've got to keep it clean, keep it clean, keep it clean, so it will reflect really directly. That's a kind of gradualist way. And the Sixth Ancestor was saying, no, that's, there's no edge to this mirror. Okay, anyway, I went on and on about that last week, so I won't keep going on. Um, so what I want to talk about this week a little bit to start out with is this mirror. So what, um, what uh, our friend Menzon... One way of understanding what he's encouraging us to do is to take this mysterious mirror um, really seriously as uh, the mind of nirvana. You remember in the beginning, he brings up this term, the wondrous mind of nirvana. And he has a whole bunch of synonyms for that the storehouse of the true Dharma I. Jiju on myself receiving and employing samadhi, the samadhi of innumerable meanings, the 
samadhi that's the king of samadhis, and so forth. It says all of these terms that we use to um, talk about awakening, um, it is, I'm saying, it's like this mirror that has no edge. And um, all of the practice we do is like gazing into this mirror. And the wonderful thing about this mirror is um, uh, it does not discriminate. It doesn't discriminate between awakening and ignorance. It doesn't discriminate between good or bad. It doesn't discriminate against any of those things. And that's what makes it wondrous, is there's nothing we can hold on to and define or nail down and that our job is not to try to leverage out the stuff that is um, difficult for us, but to wake up to the nature of this whole uh, mind itself. Right? So a circle like this is oftentimes the symbol for mind or heart. So like what we call the Heart Sutra, the Hanya Shingyo, is this character. But oftentimes it gets translated as mind. Um, I kind of prefer heart, but we get so sappy when we use the word heart. So that's one of the reasons I think people like, they prefer to use mind. But when we use mind, we get so top heavy, like as if we thought the mind was here. And so that's also a kind of problem. So then sometimes people start hyphenating it and calling heart mind. And then that kind of makes you want to throw up. So um, anyway, welcome to my um, world. <laughs> um, so we can. I try to use heart sometimes and mind sometimes, but you can think of them um, uh, kind of uh, uh, together. And um, and in the oldest kinds of teachings in Buddhism, we can find the example of mind being referred to uh, as a mirror. So I know a number of you uh, studied with me um, some years ago the awakening of faith in the Mahayana. Daijo uh, Kishinron, it's called. Um, and that's a writing that's attributed to Ashvagosa, um, who's, you know, way back there, like 11th, 12th ancestor, something like that. And um, just in case you're one of those people, if, you, if you're interested in going and looking at and re looking at this metaphor of uh, the mirror, it's on page 12 of the packet we were using at that time. And um, he, he uses mirror, uh, I'll just read you a part of this. He says, um, the essence of enlightenment has four great significances that are identical with those of empty space or that are analogous to those of a bright mirror. So he's saying that uh, enlightenment can be talked about as a bright mirror. And because he's Ashvagosa, he goes into a very... Um, complicated um, kind of like graphing out of how that mirror um, is used. Again, for people who studied that before, that might be worth, um, might be worth looking up. But for, for others, it's just the point that I, that I, what I want to point to here is that this idea of a mirror goes back really far um, in antiquity to talk about, uh, to talk about mind. Um, you notice there's a mirror on our altar. Um, that's there for a reason. <laughs> the biggest reason, you know why? Because there was in my teacher's altar. <laughs> there was a mirror. And I asked him, is it okay if I put a mirror on the altar? And he said yes. And I'm still endeavoring to, under, to understand it. Um, for those of you who studied about the um, Yogacara school of, um, of Buddhism, which some of you have, um, you'll remember the different layers of consciousness that are um, put forth in that school. And so the deepest layer of consciousness is known as the storehouse consciousness, the alaya vijnana or alaya consciousness. And um, that alaya consciousness is the seed for all karmic um, roots. All, every action that we, that we make, every thought that we have, everything that we do in any of our lives is said to leave a mark there in that consciousness. The transformation of that consciousness in an awakened being is called... What do you think? <laughs> it's the great round mirror wisdom. Yeah. Great round mirror wisdom. So this kind of uh, image of the mirror uh, as fundamental 
um, goes all the way back there. Again, what I want to bring forth here is just to talk, the way I think it's such a good symbol in this case is the mirror doesn't reject anything, right? It's not saying enlightenment's over here and delusion is over here and we're going to take enlightenment over delusion. Menzon's point is that that way of thinking is the root of the problem in the first place. So we've got to do something else. Um, we've got to look into the mirror and clarify delusion. That's where we ended last time. Don't try to get rid of the delusion or avoid the delusion, but the illumination of the wisdom mind will melt delusion. Or that's the term he used, melt. Um, it will, uh, you'll be able to see through delusion. You'll clarify what delusion is. And, um, and then he's going to go into this section, which we'll talk a little bit tonight, about talking about delusion. What do we mean by delusion? And I was really trying to focus uh, or, or emphasize last week that the Buddha never left delusion. This is really important. The Buddha didn't go, I'm awakened, and lift up into some realm that had nothing to do with the likes of us. That's not, that's not what the story is. The story is that he woke up and he stayed right here. And the further story is, is although his, his um, physical body um, uh, passed into final nirvana, that the Buddha stayed here, that awakening stayed here, in all kinds of different levels, as the body of the Sangha, that's one way, as the teachings, as a body that lives in different realms other than the material realms, as nature, as consciousness, and that that awakening never separates from delusion. But in the functioning of the Buddha, it stays present for delusion. And because it stays present for delusion, because awakening stays present for and to delusion, there's a possibility to transform delusion. If the Buddha just woke up and took off, that's called a Pracheka Buddha. They're super cool, not super helpful, right? Because they don't help anybody because they're Pracheka Buddhas, they're loners. They, they wake up on their own and they stay on their own. And that's not the bodhisattva path that is recommended in the Mahayana. Okay, so let's look at this whole business of uh, illusion, which I think we're all quite familiar with, but um, let's look at some of the explanation a bit. So I think um, in the text, this all starts somewhere around 14. So on page 14, like the second full paragraph starts with the term mumyo. It starts with what term? Mumyo. Which he, I think, translates as illusory mind. So that's page 14, the second full paragraph. There's a little bit from a previous paragraph up above and then the second one. For those of you who are character oriented um, these are the characters and this means no and this means illumination Good. oh if you have um, um, would you give um, Junae one of the better texts he'll give you a better text you're using a, a, a different one I think. it's the standard one so you'll hop around all for next eight classes. <laughs> yeah. So it's interesting. What is called illusory mind here in, um, in uh, 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 Chinese characters is referred to as mumyo or, the, or no illumination. Right? So again, if you come back to the mirror symbolism that uh, the light of the mirror goes dark or the light of the mirror gets trapped in a kind of transfixed in an object in the mirror. And when we get transfixed in the object in the mirror, then we're just transfixed by the object. We no longer see the illumination. We just see the kind of solidity of the object. We don't, we no longer are, um, are uh, aware of the illumination. This is the kind of um, uh, image that's being cast anyway. So uh, he says illusory world or illusory mind. Sometimes this is referred to as ignorance. It's very close to the word delusion, 
which is slightly different in the Chinese, but we can use them, they're used almost synonymous, synonymously. Delusion is seen as being one of the three poisons, greed, hate, and delusion. So in that sense, delusion is a deep misunderstanding about the nature of being. Right? And we think that we're separate entities, separate permanent entities of some kind, um, that we have a self and that we're related to others. And when we're in that mindset, greed and hate become the natural outcome of it. So when you see in the iconography for this greed, hate, and delusion is usually depicted um, by a snake and a pig and a, a chicken or a rooster. Right? And um, the rooster um, uh, and the um, chicken, um, I'm sorry, the rooster and the snake are usually coming out of the um, mouth of the pig. And the pig is seen as, uh, oh no, that's not right. Greed is the pig, hate is the snake. No, roosters hate. Isn't ignorance the pig? Yeah, I think you're right, because I remember that, because the pigs are smart. Actually, pigs are actually smart, but people dump on them and they call them ignorant. So I think you're right. Yeah, the pig is ignorant, and then there's the snake and the bird coming out of the mouth of the pig. That's very common um, iconography. So it's seen that ignorance is this kind of fundamental problem it sprouts, the attitude of ignorance or the attitude of this illusory mind sprouts a way of acting in the world which is just based in bring the things that I want close to me and keep the things I don't want far away from me. The push and pull of illusory mind. Here's a couple ways to um, describe uh, mumyo or, or illusory mind from a big dictionary I have. It's an obstinate misunderstanding about the nature of the person and the world. I really like that word obstinate in here. It, uh, Menzon uses it too. Obstinate misunderstanding about the nature of the person and the world. An active misconstruction of the nature of reality. Now we notice in both of these that it's not just like a general um, foolishness. It is a way of being. It is a, it's something that has roots in us. It's a way that we act over and over again, which reinforces itself. So when we act in such a way to think that I'm an independently existing being in a world of objects in which I'm the subject, that just plays back on itself and it reinforces itself. Right? It's, not, it's not just I'm walking around going, no, I don't know what's going on. Actually, I'm actively participating in creating a world that's based in that greed, um, uh, greed and hate. It's the opposite of wisdom or prajna. So those two are put in contradistinction to each other. Buddha wisdom, which we'll talk about tonight too, that's seen on one side, and um, on this side, uh, uh, mumyo or illusory mind is the other. On page 14, um, in that same paragraph, right after it says Mumyo, he has, it's on the third line, starting on the end of the third line of that paragraph. He says, it is our discriminating mind which obstinately clings to body, mind, and the world, and all things, as being the way we have perceived and recognized them until now. I think this is a really straightforward um, uh, explanation. Obstinate clinging to body, mind, and the world, and all things as being the way we have perceived and recognized them until now. Can Say again? Can you define obstinate? Obstinate being like um, it has its own inertia and it just it keeps going in its own, like, um, its own stubborn way. It's not, it's not just kind of laying there. Right, and doing some and something else coming along would just negate it. It has its own trajectory. Classical way to understand this would be the flow of karma. So karma isn't inert. Karma actually, the word means action, and it's a movement. And the movement of that karma is like a living body that's that's moving, and it has it has a trajectory. And so um, uh, this kind of ignorance is 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 part of that. So, um, so then he goes on to, to talk uh, quite a bit about the, the, the relativity and causal nature of our views. 
So if we just believe in our views, it's like, well, it looks like this to me, that must be the way it is. I mean, that's obviously not how things are, right? But we act as if it is all the time. And sometimes that's really convenient. Like, I, I think it's good to have the view that the car that's coming is going 50 miles an hour. Um, you know, you've got to settle on something, right? Because you've got to make a choice about whether you're going to cross the street or not. So he's not saying that those kind of views are in themselves a problem. It's just that we cling to them as if they don't come from a set of causes and conditions. We think of them as being ultimately true when they're relatively true. Right? They're provisionally true. So uh, he's saying that that kind of um, uh, grasping gets us um, into trouble. And uh, he uses some examples. He uses some examples there. Gosh. Did you, get, did you guys have to wear these as you get older? I know some people have to wear them when you're not as old, older, too, but um, they just change really quick. Like, it was just okay, and then it wasn't okay anymore. So um, I guess that's my example of relativity. So here he says some interesting things. He says, um, uh, where'd he go? Ah, up here on the top of page 15. Birds fly in the sky without any trouble, but fish cannot live in the sky. Fish swim freely in the water, though birds will die in the water. This is my favorite. Maggots do not think feces is filthy. <laughs> A tademushi does not know bitterness. A fire mouse lives in fire. There is a species of crab that lives in very hot water. Okay? So this is just his way of, um, of uh, calling our um, you know, views um, into the... Um, the forefront. And then here at, on the next paragraph, um, uh, uh, he emphasizes again, illusory mind is the root of delusion. That is stubborn attachment to one-sided point of view formed by our own conditioned perceptions based on personal experiences. And that's what we invest in. But at the bottom of that paragraph, pay special attention to this. He says, this is from the fourth line from the bottom on the right-hand side, the word starts originally. He says, originally, all beings are outside of illusory mind and are beyond evaluation or differentiation. You must realize this clearly and without any doubt. So I think this is really one of the, um, you know, maybe in this section about, about illusory mind, this is a really key sentence. Everything else, he's trying to give us examples. You know, he goes on in the next part, he's talking about the elephant, the story of the elephant where the king has an elephant and brings in his five uh, blind uh, fellows and says, you know, touch the elephant and he has each one and explain what an elephant is. And, you know, one says, oh, it's like a tree because they're touching the leg and, and go around. He says, see, none of them really understand the whole body of the elephant. And so they just describe it from their point of view. And so he's using a lot of ways to talk about how our partial view is problematic, but we invest in it. But this line, he's saying something different. He's saying, originally, all beings are outside of illusory mind and are beyond evaluation or differentiation. You must realize this clearly and without any doubt. This term, realize, is, I really don't know why Okumura Roshi chose this word. I mean, I kind of, it's a hard, it's a hard, um, uh, Thing to try to figure out how to translate. But in the Chinese, it might be better to say something like to decide and settle down in. To make actual, to make real, um, something like that. It's made up of two characters. The... Um, First character is like this. This usually means something like decide. Um, and then the second character, um, make sure I get it right, is like this. And this character is something like to be stable in. Could, could I just ask a little yeah. bit about clarification? Sure. So, so just before originally, um, so he's talking about each living being in the ten realms has his own their own view of everything. Yep. Right. How could their pictures of the world possibly be the same? So then how so then I'm just wondering about the relationship of those sentences to then 
originally right. all beings are outside of illusionary mind and are beyond evaluation or differentiation. Yeah. So, so when we say here illusionary mind, are we talking about all of our minds? Yes. Or the mind? So that when we, that's us, our illusionary mind, correct? So then how we perceive others, mm -hmm. so, so our perceiving of others, so we, our intention is to not perceive them through this delusionary mind, right. to yeah. perceive them in all their differentiation. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. On one level, but let me take it to another place, okay. which is, let's go back to the mirror. Okay. So if we, if we try to understand what he's saying here in the image of the mirror, he's saying, yeah, all of those images that are showing up in the mirror are karma. They're causes and conditions. Okay. They're in the 10 realms. Okay. They're all these different things. And of course we experience that. And of course we see things from where we see them from. When we look into the mirror, we see something. Right. But he's saying, fundamentally, None of that is ultimately real. Right. It's all right. causes and conditions that are showing up in the mirror. So he's saying that we should we should see into that, or we should. That's why this 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 term he says realize it, but this term is a little bit different. Um, I'm going to use this kind of clunky term, settle down in. So he's saying you should decide and settle down. See for yourself that the provisional way that you see the world is not ultimately reliable. Right. And, and really invest in that truth. That, 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 that this is constantly true. Yes. There yes. is no deviation. Right. It doesn't mean what you experience is false. I understand. It just means that it isn't true in the way that you provisionally think of it as, right. being, as right. being true. Yeah. Okay. Um, can we think about the obstinacy of our clinging uh, to include the practices by which we invent a world that's in its structure delusory? Yeah, exactly. Like, like so, like private property. Yeah. We create private property. Yeah. yeah. We act as though it's real. Yeah. And that's part of our clinging. Yeah. The delusion. Yeah, exactly. And, and and so to kind of let go of that. Yeah. It's like you get vertigo. Right. Oh, hundred percent, hundred percent. Yep. But not private property would also be delusional. So every, every, it's all, it's all. He's not, he's not telling us here that we should just reject everything. He's saying that the particular way we invest in it is problematic. Now, I think this is fairly easy for us to understand if we've been educated in a modern kind of Western way, at least, that um, we're all about relativity. When we were, t we study about that all the time. And so I'm not saying everybody takes the lesson really deeply and applies it in their way of looking at the world, et cetera, but we have a lot of access to this that would be more revolutionary in most other times um, in times and places. Um, uh, but I think the thing that's really different than the way that we normally think about it is it tends to veer towards a kind of um, negation of everything. It, te it tends to veer towards a kind of nihilism to say everything's devoid of meaning, meaning is only made. And that, that avenue um, is, is our tendency, where he's going to say something else. He's going to say there's something in contradistinction to this um, illusory mind, and that's Buddha wisdom. And that's what we should pay attention to. But the Buddha wisdom, the tricky thing is, if it becomes a view, then it's illusory mind. And that, that, how do we reconcile that? Or how do we practice with those two, those two sides? Yeah. So, in, so back to this a little bit, the, the, the decide and settle down in, when we hear the word realize, we think like, oh, I'm gonna get it. Like if I just pay enough attention pretty soon, it'll, it'll go off in my head and then I realize that that's true. And he's saying something else here. He's not, that, that's, not that's not what he's saying. He's saying, See the truth of it, and then decide that you'll act accordingly. Um, uh, and then it opens up another kind of possibility. And so then on the bottom of page 16, I guess this is probably the kicker about illusory mind. 
Um, and again, he's going back to don't use the lever. In the, the last paragraph on page 16, he says, Therefore, no one can be free from delusions until illusory mind has been dropped off. No matter how diligently one continues to do good deeds, if these deeds are done with a blind mind, the result will be only a limited happiness in the world of human or heavenly beings. So he's saying you can make things better, but they'll just be better. That's it. And things that are better get worse. That's what it means for things to be better, is they're just teetering on the opportunity to get worse. They're unstable. And so he's saying, when we really see that, now we have other kind of, we have other kind of possibility to think about, uh, to think about practice. This is something that, uh, that in the Mahayana teachings, particularly the Prajnaparamita teachings, um, we, we see brought up again and again. That if we're really interested in liberation, if we, if we use this conventional mind of good and bad, that we can't really get to it. It doesn't mean we shouldn't do wholesome things or what we think of as good things. It's just with what mind will you do then? So if you think about something like, uh, you think about the, the paramitas, which is he'll come into in this next section on, um, uh, on the uh, Buddha wisdom. Um, if we, if we uh, enact generosity without real wisdom, it's really, it's good to be generous. Like we think like, oh, I'm a great person and to show my greatness, I will give things to other people. That's great. And actually, I think your life will become better if you do that. Um, but it won't really liberate things. It's still stuck in the same, I'm me, they're them, I give them things that I had, and the same illusory world keeps a hold on everything. Um, this is one of the big issues with, um, you know, oftentimes people in, uh, um, uh, you know, in uh, Buddhist communities, including ours, will say, well, why don't, you know, we should be more involved in charity, which um, I don't, I think that we find for us to be involved in charity. But one of the things I like to bring up to people is charity can be an easy escape from the deeper dynamic of delusion that's going on. And if you look at much of the charity that comes through religious institutions, it's really a kind of um, <coughs> devil's bargain. It's like, how can we prove we're good? Well, by being generous or nice to people who are unfortunate. What country has the modern wealthy country has the largest number of disenfranchised people in its midst and also the highest level of charity. Mm -hmm. You're sitting in it, right? There's a, there's a dynamic in that which is really um, uh, interesting to look at. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't be charitable, but I'm saying that when charity isn't done with a high degree of wisdom, it's usually going to replicate the karma that created the problem in the first place. The haves and the have-nots are going to be recreated by a culture of charity. This is why lots of like radical um, leftists and anarchists really they're just like get rid of charity. That you're just buying off the poor people, right? Keeping them from like overturning the system um, because the charity just keeps things in check and everyone can know who they are. Just be a good poor person, please, and take your charity. So anyway, I'll get off my high horse about that. But, the, um, but, the, uh, but that's the kind of thing that Menzon's pointing us to. If we want to really, if, if we're stuck on being good, we won't know the liberation that is what good is supposed to define. Things aren't good because in my delusion, I've decided what good is and bad is and I'm doing the good thing. Good is something which leads to or um, operates through liberation. And liberation is escaping from that fundamental um, karmic uh, process. Mm -hmm. So, from what you just said, can we then kind of pretend that that introduces a space mm -hmm. for a concept of justice, which is not good or bad, mm -hmm. but takes into account the changing nature of the unfolding situation? Yeah, I think definitely. How, how, do you, how do you do that? Is another question. <laughs> but, um, but I think exactly, yeah. So on the top of page 17 here, then we get into this part about Buddha wisdom. So remember, he was saying before, Buddha wisdom should melt the delusion. 
So he's talking about delusion first. What is it? That kind of obstinate approach to things, which I just got to say, by the way, like when you sit down in meditation, because in a way this is everything he's talking about, um, just think about all the things that show up in this mirror that you uh, evaluate constantly. I'm sleepy. What's wrong with me? How do I wake up in Zazen? I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, what's, uh, What do you call it when you can't focus on anything? <laughs> distracted. <laughs> distracted, yes. <laughs> I'm distracted. And, uh, and, oh, what's wrong with me? And, oh, my leg hurts, and oh, what's wrong with me? All the kind of negative things where you're like, oh, if I could just be a good meditator, then everything would be great. I mean, part of what he's saying here is that's not the point, right? And, uh, and all of this, um, this stuff that we kind of judge as bad and we think we're supposed to get rid of, that's not the point. What would it mean to melt the delusion that is there? The delusion isn't the pain. The delusion isn't the distraction. That's not the point. The delusion is our um, unwillingness slash inability to um, allow an intimacy, to allow a fundamental intimacy of all of that, that the Buddha is illuminating delusion. The Buddha is right there with your distracted mind, and the Buddha is not wagging a finger at you about it. The Buddha's not like, see, I told you, you should be counting your breaths. You know, <laughs> you should, great, count your breaths. But it's not, that's not the point, you know. The Buddha's there in all luminosity. And right here, you know, right here. It's not, the Buddha's not there, like, outside you. The Buddha's not there inside you. The Buddha's beyond the inside or the outside. We should have a Buddha. Wouldn't that be good, like, a one icon with the Buddha just like? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. There's one, there's one for Jesus where he's like, I saw that. I saw that, yeah. yeah. Well, we have other, the nice things in Buddhism, we have other things. We have like Fudomyo, who just carries a big sword and a lasso. And he, and he, and he, he, gets, he, he gets you in the lasso and cuts off your delusion with a sword. So that's a better than a wagging finger. I take it back. We don't need Boy, wagging fingers. Missing his eyebrow. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so. On page, that's on the page of, top of page 17 where he's talking about this dynamic that I've been going into in terms of wisdom animating all of the, uh, all of the perfections. Um, and then he gets to this, uh, this section, where is it here? Yeah, so the second full paragraph on page 17, he says, to practice prajnaparamita means that the light of the wisdom of Gigi Uzanmai illuminates and dispels the darkness of the ignorance of delusory thoughts. Right. The practice, to practice Prajnaparamita, so that's the perfection of wisdom, which is also Gigi Uzanmai, which is also the wondrous mind of Nirvana. It is the practice of this bright mirror that has no outside. Um, means that the light of the wisdom of Jiju Zammai illuminates and dispels the darkness of the ignorance of delusory thoughts. The word in Japanese, he says dispel, illuminates and dispels, but the word in Japanese is yaburu, which means to like, kind of like rip. Uh, um, so it's kind of a very forceful, kind of a, a forceful uh, image there. And, and could it, uh, mm -hmm. This, um, if the light of the self with a capital is clear, mm -hmm. so what's that referring to in this case, in this situation, or this context? So he's saying, if the light of the self is clear, even a small good deed is the practice of inc incomparable uh, awareness. Yeah. So he's saying, before, previous to here, he's saying, like even if you do all these great things, if you do it with a delusory mind that has limited effect. But now he's saying here, if the light of self, in this case, self doesn't mean me versus other. It's the self of the self-illumination of Gigi Uzanmai. So this, this mirror is Gigi Uzanmai. Which I realize, by the way, is really hard to say. <laughs> Gigi Uzanmai. But remember, the Gigi Uzanmai, this G means self. Self receiving and employing samadhi. So when he's talking about the light of the self is clear, he's talking about Jiju Zamai, the illumination which has no other. Okay. 
And that is a kind of reference to Zazen, but not Zazen that is only defined by a, like a container of sitting still in a certain posture. Um, so that's important because we can get very, we can cling very easily to the idea of Zazen as being the physical posture of Zazen. And it is the physical posture of Zazen, but there's no, there's no, um, there's no stand for the mirror. So we both practice that posture, but also realize Zazen isn't contained by that. Zazen what? Zazen isn't contained by that. So it should be, I mean, an easy way to say it, it should be part of every part of our life. Exactly. If, we're, if, if Zazen is true, then what is true in Zazen will be true um, in everything, even the things that don't look like Zazen. And that's why in this school there's so much emphasis on like, how do you cook? How do you clean? How do you take care of your kids? How do you, you know, do all of those things? Dogen didn't write a, a lot about taking care of his kids, but um, we're making up the gap. Um, yeah, and now, so let's look here at the, at the end of um, this page on 17, because he, he um, quotes the Lotus Sutra, which always gets me excited. So he says, in the Lotus Sutra, it is said, everything Buddhas do is for the instruction of bodhisattvas. All that they do is for just one purpose. That is to show sentient beings Buddha's wisdom and enable them to see reality as a whole. Buddha's wisdom means that Buddhas see and know all things without delusory thoughts. Therefore, Buddhas enable sentient beings to depart from illusory mind and gain wisdom equal to their own. This is the core of the teachings. So I think this is just freaking revolutionary. I'm going to draw you a picture because that's what I do. Um, we'll go over here. You know, again, our, our tendency is to think of Buddha and uh, Deluded Bee. Okay. So what he's saying is there's no separation. These Buddhas, they're here for only one reason, and that is the total illumination of this deluded being. That's the, the Lotus Sutra is really clear about that. that. That's why he quotes it here. Everything Buddhas do is for the instruction of bodhisattvas. What is that instruction? All that they do is for just one purpose. That is to show sentient beings Buddha's wisdom and enable them to see reality as a whole. So they just illuminate our delusion. It's constantly. So that part isn't so, that isn't so revolutionary to me. That just sounds like really great being, right? The Buddha. But it's this next part. Um, Buddhas enable sentient beings to depart from illusory mind and gain wisdom equal to their own. And the reason is that this illuminated viewing of the Buddha enables us. It enables us to see in the same way as the Buddha because we are seen in that way. We can see in that way. The eye, this eye, okay, it's not a literal eye. Or it is a literal eye, but not your literal physical eye. Okay, which is here. There is an eye here. And this eye being seen by this eye means this eye can see this eye and can see all things in that way. Um, I don't know if that makes any sense or not. But, but, this is the, uh, you'll hear sometimes the, um, the, the kanon doko is the word in um, Japanese. It means like this mysterious um, communication of supplication and response is the way that it's usually translated. So when we come to the Buddha with our, with our, um, uh, our vow and our hopes for a transformed life, Buddhas will respond. But they don't respond by just giving us what we want. They respond by seeing us clearly. And because they see us clearly, we can also see in a different way. Um, and we could say that's what Zazen is. But people come to the temple and say, oh, I want to practice Buddhism. I want to, I want to learn. I want to transform something in my life. We say, sit down. 
You're just sitting. This eye is actually only one eye, which is this mirror. And we say, oh, let's sit, let's sit down. Let's sit down. Because this, this consciousness is totally available um, uh, everywhere, all the time. Isn't that exciting? Uh-huh. Um, I don't understand, but, um, but I have a frame for not understanding this, mm-hmm. which is that it's really weird to think that the self is a mirror that has no self. Because mm-hmm. it, like, what we think of a mirror as doing is reflecting something other. Mm-hmm. But this, you know, if all mind is... <clears throat> If it's you know reflecting all the way down, if it's relating all the mm-hmm. way down, it's all it's all the eye seeing the eye. Yeah. You want to know something trippy? So I told you there's a mirror up there, on that post that's on the other side of the yard, and the top. You know what's written on the very top of the post? Mirror. Uh-huh. <laughs> Great round wisdom mirror. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's and that's on purpose because in the when we articulate this. Um, this uh, sacred space of practice, um, that mirroring is, is shown. When In the ritual work that we do in a few weeks here, we'll have the, the festival of segaki, or making offerings to the hungry ghosts. And in that uh, ritual, which happens in many rituals, the assembly will first face the Buddha and make prostrations and veneration and chanting and, and offerings, and then will turn. It'll just be the people in the center that do it symbolically for the whole assembly, but they will rotate, and then the doshi or the celebrant will turn and face the other direction. Right? And this is the mirror of the world, which is all of the multiplicity and, we could say, delusion of, of the world, samsara, which is a mirror. And... And the Buddha's illumination is meeting that mirror. The mirror of the Buddha's illumination is meeting that mirror. And so we enact that in the way that we make offerings. Um, when we come all the time and we're making offerings, same thing's happening, the, the Buddha's mirroring us. But in this case, we become the representative of the Buddha's assembly and we turn and now we, are, um, we make the offerings in that spirit. We make the offerings as an um, awakened being. So... Is ritual the activity of polishing the mirror? Well, that's so. That's yes, and that's the that's what I was trying to get to. Thank you for that. This is why I think a lot of people, you know, the, the traditional thing is just to be like the sixth ancestor got it, and the guy who was supposed to become the sixth ancestor, eh, he's gradual, he doesn't really get it, right? But that I think is total misunderstanding. Like if you read the Platform Sutra, for example, that's how it sounds. It's like a polemic to support the followers of the Sixth Ancestor. Because the guy who didn't become the Sixth Ancestor actually did become the Sixth Ancestor, but in a different lineage. And he had his own school that thought he was groovy, right? But our school was like, mm-mm. So it becomes that kind of a like, like these get divided. But my point is that this is actually the description of how to do this. You've got to polish the mirror. You've got to melt the delusion. But the question is, how do you melt it? And the Sixth Ancestor's answer to how you melt the delusion was, ask about how it is that you're framing the mirror. Ask about how it is that you're creating these objects of, uh, of mind. And call that into question. Um, and uh, allow rather than to try to force out the delusion. And in that allowance, you'll come, you'll come to a deeper understanding that this kind of digging yourself, you know, this kind of digs you into a hole where you get to a certain level of clarity and then all you're doing is fighting off the dust. And you can't really, there's like a lot more dust than there is mirror. As soon as there's a mirror in a stand, right? As soon as you're saying, it's my mind. As soon as you're focused on like my mind, my experience, there's way more dust. Like there's every other particle in the cosmos that is not that. And so he's saying, you're never going to be able to keep that clean. There's another possibility. Yeah. So the ritual work is that. Yeah, the zazen is that. Um, living is that. So, um, so I will say this. This is my summary. Don't get stuck on the flypaper of delusion. 
It, so if you remember, if you ever watched Bugs Bunny cartoons? Some of you? You remember like Elmer Fudd? There'd always be the flypaper. Someone would put the flypaper out, right? And then, you know, they would touch it. And then they'd try to get it off and push with the other hand. And they couldn't. And then they'd push with their foot. And then pretty soon, I love it, they'd just be totally enveloped. Like the flypaper would just get as big as it needed to be to cover their whole body because it's cartoon. And, and then they would be all covered in the, in, in the flypaper. But that's how it is. That's how delusion is. It's delusion all the way down. And you won't win. Because as soon as you fight it, now you're playing by the rules of delusion. And it's got you. So that doesn't mean that we should simply say, oh, delusion rocks. Just whatever. Right? There's other option. There's another opportunity. There are beings that see delusion. And they don't oppose it. Because the opposition to delusion is the very um, root of the uh, problem in, uh, in the first place. So, so, mm -hmm. so then it seems to me that the issue is the delusionary mind can't get rid of the delusionary mind. Right. In the, in the um, Third Ancestors um, uh, writing that we recite every morning, the verses of faith mind, mm -hmm. he says, um, ma, uh, how does it go? Mind... Uh, mind working on mind, isn't this a great delusion? Using like mind to cultivate mind. Ah, yeah, using mind to cultivate mind. Is this not a great mistake? Mm -hmm. right? So when we think of mind uh, as, a, as a thing, and then that thing acts upon another thing, we're just stuck in that same, we're stuck in that same place. Okay? Now again, this is all a lead up to him trying to teach us more precisely what Zazen is about. If we only hear this in a philosophical way, we kind of just, you might just end up just kind of being like, there's nothing to do. And then, and, um, and maybe there's not. But this is all a lead up to talk about what practice is about. Right? Um, so keep that in mind because all of this kind of talk can you just kind of type up and not, and then you'll find yourself at YouTube in the middle of the night watching videos about free will. Um, <laughs> not that I've ever been there before. Um, so I want to read you this koan, which I really love, and then a poem. Um, and uh, if, if things have been a little incomprehensible, they might take a turn to another level of incomprehensibility, but please stick with me. So this is the 52nd chapter of um, the Book of Serenity, which is a collection of 100 koans that's particularly prized within the Soto school, um, with commentary by uh, Dogen's great-great-uncle in the Dharma named Wan Shi Zenji, or Hongzhir, and um, the, who Dogen always referred to as the Old Buddha. Uh, he was really, um, this was kind of his, one of his favorite teachers. And he didn't have, a, a, he didn't have Dharma ears. Um, he was probably too smart for that. Um, so this is, the, um, this is the 52nd case. And this is about Chao Shan and the Elder De. So Chao Shan asked Elder De, The Buddha's true reality body is like space. It manifests form in response to beings, like the moon in the water. How do you explain the principle of response? Day said, like a donkey looking in a well. Chao Shan said, you said a lot indeed, but you only said 80%. Day said, what about you, teacher? Chao Shan said, like the well looking at the donkey. Okay. So I'll, I'll kind of go through the phrase again, cutting some things out so you just get the thread of it. The Buddha's true reality body is like space. No edge. It's like the everythingness of everythingness. Mm -hmm. Or well, on the other side, that Buddha that's sitting up above, just illuminating. Okay? It manifests form in response to beings, like the moon in the water. So that Buddha shows up. It shows up in response. That's what he's saying here, quoting the Lotus Sutra. It shows up in response to the needs of any being. And you can see how that's an image like a moon, like the moon's up in the sky, right? And it's just totally luminous and seems distant. But in any, any amount of water, it will show up, right? So if water's like, like beings, in any, whether it's a great pool of water, or a small pool of water, a deep pool of water, a, a shallow pool of water, the moon will show up there. So this oftentimes becomes a symbol for how awakening shows up in the world. 
So this is what the teacher is um, bringing up, Chao Shang. He asks this elder monk. He says, so he says, how do you explain the principle of this response? So what's going on here? And De, who seems like a cool guy, he says, it's like a donkey looking in a well. Now donkey, this is just kind of a fun expression, but also donkey is a symbol for ignorance. So the donkey is seen as being like unenlightened and then oftentimes the horse becomes the symbol for, for awakening or an enlightened being. Right? So a donkey staring in the well. I love that image. You know, it's the donkey's looking in the well and the moon is there reflecting um, uh, in the water that's there uh, in the well. And so uh, Chao Shan, again his teacher, he says, you said a lot indeed. Great job. But you've only said 80% of it. This is things teachers are famous for saying. Mm-hmm. And De says, well, what about you, teacher? And he says, it's like the well looking at the donkey. You see, he, he's... Uh, uh, The well, the well looks at the donkey. If this is the donkey, we'll give him some ears. <laughs> and there's the well with the water at the bottom. He's, he's looking down here and this moon is, appear, you know, is appearing here. So the well, the well is often a symbol for, for the eye. I oftentimes talk about that, the dark well or the pupil of the eye. So... He's saying, the, the, the De says, it's like a donkey. It's like an ignorant being. It's like the jerk that I am, transfixed by the illumination of something that is pulling me towards more truth. You know, he doesn't deny his donkey nature. Right? This is really important. As Buddhist practitioners, it's so easy for us to be like, okay, I'm going to be better than that. And that becomes our project to kind of like, pull ourselves together as being good people in some way. And um, I don't encourage you to be a bad person, but that project of kind of like a sort of pulling ourselves together as a good person, it just misses the real treasure. You know, like be a donkey, duh, like looking in the well. And, uh, and, uh, and so then Chao Shan just changes it. He says, yeah, that's true. That's 80%. He doesn't say half. That's interesting too. He doesn't say you said half of it. He says, you say 80% of it. And he said, well, what, what more is there? And he says, uh, the well's looking at the donkey. So I'll read you one more thing, and then we can finish up, and I'll go find out about my baby. My baby's baby. So I want to call this my favorite poem by Dogen, but I don't know if I could say that because... I think that about all of the poems of Dogen that I like, which I don't like all of them. Um, actually, a lot of them I don't. They're too kind of like, too, like, I don't know. Like, you guys ever read haiku? Mm-hmm. And Basho, he's great and everything, but I just get so sick of Basho. It's always a reference of this and that. All of it's, a too, it's too perfect, you know? And so sometimes I feel like Dogen's poems are like that. But this one, and I don't know if he wrote it or not. It's, uh, it's a Dogen's portrait watching the moon. So this is a very famous picture. Probably if you've seen a painting of Dogen before, it's probably this painting. And it's, um, it's kept at Hokyoji Monastery, which um, uh, one of my very early students, Gensei, which many of you know, he, where he trained um, for his monastic training. And um, those of you who uh, know Kenzan, who's a student of uh, Taihaku, who passed away a couple years ago, Shaoshan Temple in Vermont. This is also where Taihaku's teacher was the, was the abbot there. And Kenzon also trained there. So we have, a, we have some kind of karmic connection of Hokyoji. And it was started by Jakuen Zenji, so, um, who was a, a, a student of Dogen's who came from China. He, he, tr- he studied with Dogen in China, and then he came to Japan to study with Dogen. And then he um, eventually received Dharma transmission after Dogen's death by Ejo Zenji. And then he became the important link in Dogen's lineage for Eheji. His heirs became the abbots of Eheji and protected it for hundreds of years. 
Um, so Hokyoji has this really important meaning. He's the one who founded, Jaku Nenji founded Hokyoji. After he left Eheji, he went up into the mountains and sat on a rock there. And those of you seen the picture of Gensei sitting on the rock he mm-hmm. sent to us from Hokyoji, that's, uh, that's uh, Jaku Nenji's rock. That's where he sat. And then one day, this is always the story, then one day some you know, warlord is coming by with his entourage and sees him sitting there and says, says something to him and is impressed by Jacqueline's um, uh, you know, countenance and uh, deep uh, uh, rigor and builds a monastery. And, um, and that became Jacqueline Zenji's um, uh, monastery. If it was only so easy today, sometimes I say to myself, um, you don't see me sitting on a rock night and day either, though, so maybe, <laughs> maybe that's the issue. So this portrait is there, and they, it, and they don't know if it was made during his life or not, but there's a whole group of scholars. Those are the scholars I like because they tell the story that I prefer, um, and that is that it was made during the time of Dogen, and, and it was, this was his poem and his inscription. Some fun-hating scholars try to um, uh, undermine that. Um, <laughs> So, the language isn't so great in the English. I was trying to rewrite it, but I couldn't. I'll read it to you a couple times. Autumn is spirited and refreshing as this mountain ages. A donkey observes the sky in the well, white moon floating. One is not dependent. One does not contain. Letting go, vigorous with plenty of gruel and rice flapping with vitality, right from head to tail. Above and below the heaven, clouds and water are free. So the second line, he says, a donkey observes the sky in the well, white moon floating. So remember, this is on his self-portrait. So Dogen here is... He's also the mountain, so that's the way you can understand. He says, autumn is spirited and refreshing as this mountain ages. He's probably referring to himself. He is, at this point, you know, he's the, he's the abbot of Eheji, which usually a temple is also referred to as a mountain. So like when I call, um, like when I call my friend Kenzan um, and Shaoshan, I always ask, I always say, how is the mountain? And when I ask that, I mean Shaoshan, but I also mean him. Right? So that's probably the illusion here. Autumn, it's autumn time. It's spirited and refreshing as the mountain ages. I'm getting just to that time of life where I can start to appreciate that a little bit, you know, that the aging is a kind of gift. And then he says, a donkey looking at the sky in the well with the white moon floating. One is not dependent. One does not contain. So think about that. One is not dependent. Probably that's the moon. Probably the moon is not dependent on anything. It doesn't need the water. It doesn't need any of this. It just is shining beautifully. Uh, And the sky does not contain the moon. Neither does the water. Letting go vigorous with plenty of gruel and rice. Flapping with vitality right from head to tail. Above and below the heavens. Clouds and water are free. Clouds and water is of, oftentimes a, um, a, it's a reference to um, um, renunciate wanderers are called clouds and water. Uh, unsui is the word in Japanese. But really I would say anybody who um, has the spirit for the way, um, whether your life takes that form or not, um, that's how we should endeavor to be like the clouds and the water. Like unsui. And this flapping with vitality, I know just talking about why a poem is so good doesn't actually give you the feeling of it, but the characters they use is like a flapping fish. It's like the the characters would be like a fish. And so the the flapping with vitality, you maybe could translate it as like, it would be like a a fish um, flapping uh, on the deck. But then they're caught, I guess, I don't know. A fish flapping with vitality, right from head to tail, like the whole body just moving. Do you ever get that feeling? Like that's, I remember when, um, when, Kai, when Kai was born, I just kept having this feeling of like a, you ever pick up like a puppy mm-hmm. and the puppy just like their whole body just like, they don't just move one part of it. It's just like their whole thing. And, and, and um, little kids can be like that too. Kai's super like that. And um, I love that. So that, that's this quality that he's talking about. A donkey looking in the well has this kind of vitality. 
because nothing's contained. It's not about the container of something. It's about this total illumination, which doesn't reject the donkey at all. The donkey's not kicked off the boat. It's just there staring uh, in the well. Okay, I'll stop there. <laughs> so next week, we, we, uh, we will talk. Now we're really getting down to something. Next week, if you, if you are thinking, I'm not sure about this men's on, this is too easy. Um, uh, next week is mind. So page 19 to 26, I would say right in the middle of page 19 where he says we must closely examine the so-called human mind. And it's right, right in the middle of page 19. We must closely examine the so-called human mind. And then it goes all the way to, uh, to, 20, uh, to 26, um, towards the bottom where it starts when the Tathagatas preach the Mahaprajna Paramita. So those several pages. Now this is a place where Menzan's really, you know, I, feel, I kind of feel like we've been doing a lot of preparatory work to get to this part, where now he's going to talk about this idea of the, of the mirror as being um, the heart of the matter and uh, how it is explained. things. So we'll do that next week. And then the following week is uh, session, so we won't have lecture, but of course you're welcome to come and sit. We'll have three periods of zazen that evening, so that's probably as good as hearing a lecture. Um, and then a few classes after that, then rohatsu and all kinds of stuff.